royal appointment now, a new series. In high definition on BBC One HD, Andrew Marr marks a unique anniversary and life. Radio 4 marks the Queen's Diamond Jubilee with a new series exploring a thousand years of royal treasures. The Art of Monarchy with Will Gompertz on Saturday morning at 10.30. Look at the sequence of numbers. Once covered, touch them in numerical order. Now, look at the next sequence of numbers and do the same. You've got to be kidding. He's performing feats of memory that humans simply find impossible. The boundary between human and animal intelligence is much narrower than we thought. Super Smart Animals starts Wednesday at 8 on BBC One and BBC One HD. The 10 o'clock news now on BBC One with Hugh Edwards. The former First Minister of Northern Ireland, the Reverend Ian Paisley, has been admitted to hospital in Belfast. Mr Paisley, now Lord Banside, is 85 and was taken ill yesterday. The nature of the condition uh, isn't known. He suffered serious ill health in the past. His family has appealed for privacy at a difficult time. Senior executives at Network Rail have decided not to accept their bonuses. The Transport Secretary, Justine Greening, has said that uh, she would go to the firm's annual general meeting this week and vote against the payments, but said she wasn't able to veto them. Network Rail said the bonus money would now be allocated to improving safety, as our deputy political editor, James Landale, reports. Last week, the boss of RBS, Stephen Hester, gave up his bonus. This week, the people who run our railways gave up theirs. Sir David Higgins, Network Rail's chief executive, could have got as much as £340,000. But under huge pressure, he and his fellow directors said they'd waive their bonuses for this year. The new Transport Secretary was being urged to use all the levers she had to halt the bonuses. She'd promised to vote against them at a meeting this Friday. That meeting has now been postponed. And Justin Greening welcomed the rethink. I think that's a sensible decision, it's a welcome decision. And I think it shows that they've understood the public mood on this issue at the moment. Labour said it was their pressure that had forced ministers to act against a company that gets around four billion pounds a year from the taxpayer. It's just a pity that Justin Greening and the government have been out of touch, haven't realised that this is something that matters a lot to the public and didn't take action earlier. But I do welcome the fact that Network Rail have done her job for her. Network Rail has been criticised for late running trains and last week it also admitted mistakes that led to the deaths of two girls at an Essex level crossing. The company said any spare bonus cash would help make crossings safer, but the father of one of the victims said it wasn't enough. I mean the amount that's needed to improve rail crossing safety is huge and this is, this is nothing more than a gesture and I, I don't see it as any more than that. From London commuters there was a mixed response to the decision on bonuses. Hallelujah! <laughs> I would say that's a triumph for common sense. Everyone is, is feeling the crunch, so yeah, why shouldn't they? Without incentive, then companies don't flourish. Therefore, the country doesn't flourish. Clearly, the political row over bonuses is beginning to have an impact, at least in companies with some public funding, like Network Rail. But it's too early to say if there's a new culture of restraint here, particularly in the private sector. There are a lot of bonuses still to be awarded in the coming days. And in the city, some are worried. What you don't expect is for a message, whether it's true or not, to come across from the government that it's got an anti-business message. And whether that's denied emphatically or not, that is the message that we're not only getting in the city of London, but we're getting right across the world of business, industry and commerce. It has to stop. But for now, there appears little light at the end of the tunnel for company bosses. Their bonus deals are exposed to the harsh light of scrutiny, for many, there's a difficult journey ahead. James Leno, BBC News, Westminster. The Leveson inquiry into press standards has heard from Paul Dacre, editor-in-chief of the Daily Mail. Mr Dacre made a robust defence of his paper's journalism, saying that celebrities who use their lifestyles to promote themselves should be subject to press scrutiny and criticism. Mr Dacre also insisted that phone hacking had never taken place at the Mail's papers, as Nick Hyam reports. He's the man who runs Britain's second biggest daily with ferocious drive and a natural feel for his readers' prejudices, though he prefers to call them anxieties. 
Paul Dacre rarely appears in public, but today he came to the Leveson Inquiry and lived up to his reputation as one of Fleet Street's most combative editors and one with a clear sense of right and wrong. Otherwise, a lot of celebrities, celebrity chefs, sports people, who make a lot of money by revealing their lives to the public. I believe newspapers should be given some latitude and look into their lives when they err. Uh, um, um, Sorry, on, by, by, by err, do you mean err uh, morally? Well, we're then going into a definition of what morality is, aren't we? He was asked about a Jan Moyer article about the death of boyzone singer Stephen Gately. Thousands complained it was homophobic, but other papers carried similar stories. He'd brought examples with him. I did have sex with Stephen on night he died. Mm. Cops, Stephen had smoked cannabis. Last week, Baroness Hollis complained about male coverage of a knife attack which left her daughter, Abigail Witchells, paralysed. Paul Dacre said the coverage had been compassionate and superbly sensitive. And then there was Hugh Grant, who'd come to the inquiry to accuse the mail papers of phone hacking. That, said the mail at the time, was a mendacious smear. Today, Paul Dacre stood by that phrase. There'd been no phone hacking at the mail, he said. And he went further. Mr Grant has spent his life invading his own privacy, exposing every intimate detail of his that life to the, the question, Mr. Now, Mr. hang on, let, please let me finish. Particularly, he has spoken frequently about his desire to have a child, particularly at the time when he, he was making a film yes. about a child. Paul Dacre also had a potentially explosive suggestion for locking newspapers into a future system of voluntary self-regulation. Get the newspaper industry to issue reporters with a press card like this. Without it, they wouldn't be allowed to report the courts, police press conferences and other official events. It would, he said, be like a kite mark for responsible journalism. But some are already saying it's a bit too close to licensing journalists, something unacceptable in a free society. Nick Hyam, BBC News, at the Leveson Inquiry. And coming up on tonight's programme. Join me to hear the remarkable stories of three people who sat to have their portrait painted by Lucian Freud. The Queen has marked the 60th anniversary of her accession to the throne with a visit to Kings Lynn in Norfolk. The visit was the start of celebrations for the Diamond Jubilee, which will be formally marked with four days of celebration in early June. During the day, royal gun salutes were fired in several locations, as our royal correspondent Nicholas Witchell reports. It's what she's been doing for 60 years now, constant and understated. Today at an infant school in Dursingham, where the children were offering their thanks for her 60 years on the throne. From Buckingham Palace, there were new photographs and a message. In this special year, the Queen says, as I dedicate myself anew to your service, I hope we will all be reminded of the power of togetherness and the convening strength of family, friendship and good neighbourliness. That sentence really embraces many of the themes of the Queen's reign, above all of service and dedication. Themes which she carried forward after the death here at Sandringham on the 6th of February 1952 of her father, George VI. Elizabeth was then 25. She was in Kenya when she heard that she was now Queen. She and her husband returned at once to London to be met by the then Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill. It was a huge upheaval, as Lady Prudence Penn, who's known the Queen for nearly 70 years, recalls. This was her destiny. In fact, Martin Chartres, her private secretary, later on said at the time, she grasped her destiny with both hands. And she did. And so what are the characteristics of this person whose image is so familiar, but whose personality remains largely hidden? She's a very strong person. She has a lot of common sense and great wisdom. She really has. It's those qualities, say her friends, which have sustained her, together with the public's reaction to events such as Prince William's marriage to Kate Middleton. All these big occasions during her reign, like her jubilees and weddings and that sort of thing, I think she was genuinely comforted by the enormous sign of affection from everybody. And there was, and there always will be. She's earned it. Very nice tulips. And what then of the future for a monarch who will be 86 this year? From a friend who knows her, there is certainty about one thing. To my mind, 
Her Majesty will remain sovereign as long as she lives. I don't think there's any question of her. Well, even if she was unable to perform her duties and pass some of those on to her family, she is still the Queen and will be until she dies. Elizabeth II, Queen for 60 years and as committed as ever to continue a lifetime of service. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News, Sandringham. England's cricketers have lost the third test against Pakistan, which means they've lost the series 3-0. It's the first test whitewash that Pakistan has inflicted on England. It could threaten England's ranking as the world's number one team. The captain, Andrew Strauss, says they just weren't good enough, as Joe Wilson reports now from Dubai. History will record that England's cricketers were tourists in Dubai. Neither time nor tide will erase the shame of the whitewash. In the third test, England were left chasing a near impossible 324 to win. Two out by lunch, losing trot was a big blow. Peterson's misreading of Syed Ajmal seemed gloomily inevitable. Peterson did nothing to advance his reputation in these matches. He wasn't alone. When Ian Bell bashed this ball straight into the hands of the fielder, he'd scored 51 runs in the whole series. A flourish from Matt Pryor took us into the late afternoon, a glimpse of what might have been. Reality was another LBW. Panasar last out, the match, and this series emphatically to Pakistan. Recognition. Once outcasts of world cricket, they'd outplayed the world's top-ranked team. We haven't been good enough or quick enough in adapting our games here, that's, that is for sure. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, I, I haven't been in, involved in a series where so many of our batsmen have, have had a hard time as this one. Well, for England, losing this series 3-0 is an embarrassment they didn't see coming. Of course, England insists they won't panic. question is, do they have the right technique? Do they have the right team? Joe Wilson, BBC News, in Dubai. The winner of the 2010 Tour de France, Alberto Contador, has been stripped of his title and banned from the sport after failing a drugs test 18 months ago. The Spanish cyclist maintains he failed the test because he had eaten meat that was contaminated with steroids. His ban is backdated, so he will be eligible to race again this summer, but will miss the London 2012 Olympics. Now, the first major exhibition of Lucian Freud's work since the artist's death last year opens at the National Portrait Gallery in London on Thursday. Freud is recognised as one of the most influential artists of his generation, known especially for his painting of the human body. Our arts editor, Will Gompertz, has been to see what the exhibition involves. You put your knee forward. Yeah, absolutely. This is very, very rare footage. Lucian Freud did not like being documented at work. It was filmed in his studio on the last day he ever painted. He was working on this, his final portrait. He died leaving it unfinished. The sitter is the same man who was allowed to film the artist at work. It is David Dawson, his longtime assistant. You would look very, very intently, closely at a certain part of, of your body, mix the colour on a palette, put one mark down, look again, clean that butt bit off on his apron, mix some more, just a slight gradient difference, put that mark down. Decision making all the time. Lucian Freud had the eyes of a hawk with which he used to intensely scrutinise his subjects. The objective was to get to the truth, to create paintings that revealed the inner personality of his sitter and the artist. He liked to paint family members and they liked to sit for him. Here is his daughter Bella. He portrayed her many times and she got to observe how he worked. If I'd go in and he just was working on something new and he'd sketched out the image, and if it was a portrait, there would be this piece around here, these brush strokes, like their mind was kind of coming to life or something. Freud was a meticulous painter. He would spend weeks, months, even years on a single portrait. He rushed for no one. I watched it, you know, slowly being made, what he did. Um, <clears throat> I could talk sit there talking until he began to paint the mouth, um, which was enjoyable. Um, and I could smoke as well. But um, yeah, it was a fascinating experience. I think it's a very good portrait. Lucian Freud's paintings have a haunting, timeless quality. 
You can feel the weight of the sitter and the intense gaze of the artist. Will Gompertz, BBC News. Well, Newsnight starts uh, over on BBC Two in a moment and they'll be looking at why Russia and China are refusing to condemn the Syrian regime. Uh, but now we can join our news teams where you are. Have a good night.